Okay. All right. It is one minute to nine, but we'll call that nine. Rarely do things get to start early around here. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the session on building your Wikidata project. Before all the good stuff gets started, um, I'll just show this slide here that gives you some information on how to get to the conference website. There you can find the code of conduct. Um, if you see anything that you think like, oh, wow, I need to tell someone about this. There are methods to, to do that both by email and anonymously. Um, if you're into Twitter, do your Twitter thing. Um, there's a, a Slack uh, instance just for the conference. There's text support in Slack and um, all of the streaming and the recorded videos will all get posted to the LD4 um, 2022 conference playlist at some point. So with that, I will introduce Will Kent. He is the Wikidata Program Manager at Wiki Education. In addition to the Wikipedia and Wikidata courses he teaches, he's a strong advocate for the adoption of Wikidata at new institutions and in new fields. Take it away, Will. Oh, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm thrilled that you're all able to attend uh, the session. I'm really excited because um, what I want to do or what we wanted to do was uh, profile some Wikidata projects uh, from people who have been through this Wikidata course just to show you that you can have a project at a variety of different kinds of institutions. Uh, and I'm excited to hear about all these projects, how they came to be and, and what's next for them. Um, and so we're going to run through, I think, six big projects uh, in one hour. It's all going to be possible, I promise. And then we'll have time for questions uh, at the end. Uh, but let's just jump right in and we'll start off with uh, Stephanie Caruso and Bettina Smith from Dumbarton Oaks. So take it away, you two. All right. Um, it's not giving me the option to share my screen. It says one participant can, one participant can share at a time. Oh, no one's sharing right now. All right, I can. Me... It's letting me share. Do you want me to share it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Sorry, I need to get it ready. <laughs> um, hold on. One I just changed it to multiple can share simultaneously. So hopefully you can. Do you want to try again? Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay. Got it. Sorry, everyone. Okay. Okay, um, thanks for having us today and um, we're looking forward to your questions. Dumbarton Oaks is a research institute and collection in the heart of Georgetown in Washington, DC. An American couple, Mildred and Robert Bliss, founded the institution, which they entrusted to Harvard University in 1940. Their mission was to create a place where scholars could come and study objects and conduct research in three main areas of study, Byzantine art, pre-Columbian art, and garden design. The core of the Dumbarton Oaks Museum collection comprises the Bliss's, objects the Blisses purchased, but to this day, the museum still actively collects. Our project aim was to upload the Dumbarton Oaks Museum collection to Wikidata in order for our collection data to be shared within a linked open data system. Prior to 2020, the web kiosk displaying the museum's collection was not linked to our collection management system, Embark, which houses the metadata pertaining to the museum's collection. Modifications to Embark metadata had to be simultaneously updated in the web kiosk. As a result, only 250 of the collection's Byzantine highlights and even fewer pre-Columbian objects existed on the museum website. When Embark and the web kiosk were linked, we were finally able to make regular updates to the data sets automatically. At that point, the museum made a push to standardize their object records and expand the online collection. Today, the majority of the Byzantine, pre-Columbian, and house collections are available to view on our web kiosk, where each object has its corresponding permalink. For the first time, we could create a Dumbarton Oaks object ID that could become an authority control in Wikidata. So before we began this project, querying Wikidata for items with a location property statement for Dumbarton Oaks yielded only 19 items. The majority of these were museum objects, mostly paintings by big name Western artists, only one entry each for objects from our Byzantine and pre-Columbian collections existed in Wikidata. Our first step was to establish a property for the unique permalink number for our collection objects. We modeled our property proposal closely after existing object ID properties such as the Mets and the National Portrait Galleries. After the proposal was accepted, we were then able to enter the unique number that appears at the end of the permalink and link 
each Wikidata item clearly back to the museum online catalog. At this point, we could go about the steps of importing our data. So we started with an export spreadsheet from Embark, which provides standard museum metadata, such as medium, creation date, and measurements. Then we extracted some basic elements, object titles, accession numbers, and the permalink IDs to create stub records in Wikidata. The first three columns of the original spreadsheet were mapped to a spreadsheet for upload to quick statements, which you see here. The Embark field display title becomes the label for the Wikidata item. The ID becomes the value in a statement for our newly created Dovart Dokes ID property and the accession number populates a statement for inventory number. So in our first trial import of object metadata to Wikidata, we tried using a very basic repeated statement for the description, such as object in the pre-Columbian collection at Dunbar and Oaks, but discovered that quick statements throws an error if you try to import items that have identical titles and identical descriptions. To solve this, we synthesized the fuller descriptions from the museum catalog into one sentence Wikidata descriptions. We then are able to create Wikidata items using quick statements. Here you see the completed import screen for a batch of pre-Columbian object metadata. And here's an example of a stub item where you can see the label, description, inventory number, and the Dunbar Notes object ID. So after those stub items are created, we can then go back to the master spreadsheet in OpenRefine and use the Wikidata reconciliation service to add further detail. The reconciliation service allows us to take museum description data and translate it to relevant Wikidata terms. So this shows a relatively fleshed out record that has fields added using OpenRefine. In the screenshot from our museum catalog, which you see at the top, um, you see a few basic lines of data for each object, period, date, measurements, materials, and accession number. For this object, we've mapped the date to an inception statement, the materials to individual width, height, and depth statements, the material to a made from material statement, and the accession number to an inventory number statement. Additionally, even though what Embark calls class system data is not displayed in the museum catalog, we have chosen to map that to an instance of statement, which for this object translates to two instances, religious object and triptych. Our future aim is to enhance the Wikidata records for our objects with more metadata, particularly with respect to acquisition history. We recognize the potential for having large sets of collection data from different institutions shared within a linked open data repository, such as Wikidata. My interest as a scholar of Byzantine art is in the so-called minor or decorative arts, which often receive the least amount of attention in cataloging projects. Museums in North America and Europe typically acquire these materials through the art market. Some of the earlier history of these objects, however, can be rediscovered when we take into account acquisition history across collections. For instance, in the case of early Byzantine textiles, as a result of collecting practices and preservation concerns, they were often cut up into fragments after their discovery. So here you can see two pieces that would have originally been part of tunics, like the one on the right. Having the acquisition history of different collections combined in a single linked open data system would go far in helping to reconstruct the early history of these often overlooked objects. Here we see one such example of a textile fragment at Dio, in Dio and one in the Metz collection. Both are very similar in form, though not identical, and both were sold to the collections by the same dealer, Dick Rand Kalekian, in the late 1940s. Interestingly, an almost identical fragment to the one in Dio was sold to the Met in 1927 by another art dealer, Adolf Lowy. Did Lowy and Kalekian have the same source for objects? Did Kalekian buy from Lowy? This inquiry is speculative, but the types of queries Wikidata allows could illuminate the links between different museum collections and perhaps even help scholars establish the early history of these little considered objects. I can only imagine the types of questions art historians could answer or simply start to ask as we work towards creating comprehensive Wikidata entries for museum objects. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you too. Uh, if you have questions, let's hold them till the end and we'll send it over uh, to Kylie Jol Jolicoeur uh, from Syracuse University Libraries. Thanks. All right, thanks. Well, let me just get this shared.
All right, so I'm going to talk about a project in which Syracuse University Libraries worked to develop local authority control using, at the time, WB Stack uh, before Wikibase Cloud was available. So in 2021, um, the Department of Digital Stewardship, which at the time was its predecessor, the Digital Library Program, started migrating our digital collections from our local system um, into Cortex, which was our newly acquired digital asset manager. And the project started with the migration of the Garrett Smith Pamphlets and Broadsides collection, which is held by the Special Collections Research Center at Syracuse University Libraries. Um, and this was moved into the larger digital Garrett Smith collection, which is a combination of three different archival collections, of which this is one, um, all of which are related to Garrett Smith's life and work um, as a politician and abolitionist in New York State. And I chose this collection um, to work on the authority control project because it had particularly robust legacy metadata and I was already in the process of combining um, the digital object metadata from our local METS manager system and our MARC metadata from our catalog um, because all of the pamphlets and broadsides had already been cataloged. The problem was that Cortex itself does not allow authority control um, with an actual local authority file. There are ways around that, which we've looked at and which some other institutions have had a lot of success with, um, but it wasn't our first choice of methods because it's not as robust as what we were looking for, and it isn't supported by the platform as fully as its, as its regular operations. So I took a look with, with my team members um, to evaluate our needs, and I outlined six major points of things that we were looking for. So the first was the ability to link records together. Um, which Cortex does not have full functionality with. Um, we also wanted to be able to search the metadata to yield matching records. The backend searching is something that um, we're working with the platform developer to improve. Um, it's a fairly new platform, so this is one of the areas that they're working to improve, but we were looking for a, a shorter term solution because we cannot search all of the metadata fields on the back end. So incomplete and unpublished assets are very, very difficult to find sometimes. Um, we also wanted, of course, to link to authority files like VF, LCNAF, even the ARC and, Ar Ar and architecture thesaurus, um, and of course, Wikidata. Uh, we also wanted the ability to batch upload and edit, uh, the ability to include descriptions, especially for unique entities in our collections, and we wanted support for change documentation on the platform, that we wouldn't have to keep all of that documentation externally. WV Stack checked all of the boxes that we were looking for. Um, so we can link the records together with the item and properties. Uh, we can search the metadata with queries. We can very easily link to authority files with URLs. Quick statement is great for batch uploads. And of course we can include descriptions and our change documentation automatically logged any changes that were made. Um, and of course the talk page as well is a fantastic feature for us to be able to record any questions or concerns or things that came up. So the approach to the project of kind of developing a proof of concept sandbox for us um, was I started with the Wikidata course, of course, um, and then moved into creating properties for our metadata application profile fields. Um, for the Cortex metadata. And this on the side here is just a, a snippet of, of what was created to kind of give an idea. And then moved into creating items for individual digital objects um, and then items for entities. And I kind of did both of these at the same time uh, with the batch upload feature um, because it made it very easy. And then creating properties for the entity fields as well. And we kept these very uh, minimal because we didn't want to be reproducing information, but we also needed to include enough information that unique entities were well described. As for the outcomes of the project, um, it was a great solution for metadata navigation. We were able to find things very easily. We were very happy with the results of it. Um, one of the kind of difficulties of it was that the Sparkle querying was often expected to be more difficult than it was. So that was kind of a, a talking point that folks expected it to be more difficult than in reality it is. Um, and then linking out to authority files, of course, very, very easy, very successful, allowed us to have information without needing to replicate it on our own records. Um, 
batch upload took some finagling for me to kind of figure out what was going where, but once I got rolling, it was very easy and straightforward. Um, and I wrote up some, you know, additional documentation for folks to do it. So it, it moved forward very easily after that first step. And the last kind of piece of the outcome is that we're now in our second phase of asset migration. So there's just no bandwidth to work on this, but we really want to set up a Wikibase Cloud um, instance for ourselves looking forward into the future when we have a little bit more of that bandwidth back once the migration is closer to complete. Um, we definitely need student support, especially for the data migration portion, um, which is something that we're working on um, kind of working forward again. Um, we definitely also want to test with our library's partners. We work a lot with the Special Collections Research Center, of course. So um, making sure that this meets their needs as well as ours, building any of the templates that we need before moving into an actual data migration onto the platform, um, getting the open or find reconciliation feature set up for our instance would be another um, piece to work on. And then just building workflows to incorporate this with our other platforms and our other ways to migrate and manage data. But even as we are still kind of considering other options, this is definitely our favorite one. And we were very happy with what we were able to achieve with it. Awesome. Thanks, Kylie. This is so fascinating. I'm glad it's working so well. Uh, so from New York, we're going to zip over to University of Colorado Boulder with Chris Long. So Chris, please take it away. Hey, thanks, everyone. Um, appreciate the opportunity to talk about a um, research project that I've been working on and um, that Wikidata is a big part of. So um, I spent the last six months of 2020 sabbatical, some of which was attending the Wikidata Institute, which I found very valuable, but most of it was spent on analyzing what I call the identifier ecosystem of the CU Boulder faculty. Uh, I spent a lot of time, a time I would only have, anyone would ever have if they were on sabbatical, recording what identifiers um, our faculty currently have. Uh, there are many, many different identifier systems that faculty use, but I focused on these five. Um, why these five? Because these are ones either that my team can uh, directly create, or in the case of VIAF that we contribute to indirectly through our NACO work, or in the case of ORCID, uh, a system that's heavily supported by um, our campus. Um, I started by getting a spreadsheet of all our faculty from the Faculty Campus Affairs Office, which include, among many different things, uh, it had their academic um, discipline and their academic rank. And I looked at all types of ranks. We have a number of different types of academic ranks, tenured and tenure track, non-tenured, administrative ranks, which are mainly people like provosts, deans, department chairs, things like that, people with varying degrees of research expectations. And I also broke uh, down the findings by academic unit to sort of give some sort of broad representation of academic discipline. And uh, happily for me, CU Boulder covers a large number of academic disciplines on this campus. The only thing we don't have on this campus is a medical school. So I had two main goals for this project. Uh, one was to assess if I could, uh, if I can, where my team's identifier crea creation efforts are best spent. Uh, we can create a number of different identifiers, but we have limited time as everyone does. So can I determine where uh, to focus our energy and where does Wikidata fit into all of this? I expect Wikidata will play a big part in this. Um, but um, the answer, I hope to find the answer by the time I've done uh, analyzing all the data. And I wanted to do this not just for the sake of doing it, uh, but to contribute to the campus's mission. Um, and all metadata work does that, but sometimes it's difficult to make a direction from catalogers work to campus mission. Sometimes it's hard to make um, a connection to our impact on that. And I'm, I think this is one place where it can. Because there are many benefits that unique identifiers provide the campus community. The most obvious ones are to faculty, uh, having a clear scholarly identity is invaluable to them for proper attribution of their scholarly work. 
and the discoverability of that work. And this promotes career advancement, tenure, and future collaborations with other scholars. Um, a clear and visible scholarly identity is uh, also important um, to librarians so they can understand their faculty's research interests better. And this helps with collection building. And the campus itself benefits uh, by being able to more accurately harvest scholarly output, scholarly productivity, and report the results of that to their governing bodies, which can enhance the college's reputation and maybe even demonstrate its value. So let's look at some of my uh, preliminary findings, emphasis on preliminary at this point. Uh, this slide shows the number, total number of the five identifiers for all faculty. And you can see that ORCID is by far the highest uh, number, and that can be contributed to our campus's persistent evangelism to faculty of having an ORCID. Now you'll see the Wikidata is there to the bottom, just a little bit under 40%. So that's a clear indication that there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. So looking at specifically now just the wiki data, this slide is a breakdown by academic rank. And so not surprisingly, the faculty with the highest research expectations, the tenured and tenure track faculty have the largest percentage of wiki data items. And full professors are the largest cohort of that. Um, I could hop, hypothesize that in general, faculty in the later stages of their career, and thus presumably with a larger scholarly footprint, would be more likely to have a wiki data item, but that's sort of allied by looking at the almost equal percentages of assistant and associate professors who are not at the same points in their career. So more investigation needed there. And this slide, slide shows the total number of faculty with Wikidata items by academic units. And we can see that natural sciences and engineering and applied science far outstrip the other disciplines with humanities and social sciences coming in at a distant third place. But of course, not all schools and departments have equal numbers of faculty, so total numbers don't tell the whole story. Um, so I also looked at the percentage of faculty within a unit that have a Wikidata item. So you can see here that education is now in second place, but there's a reason for that. Uh, my team intervened here. Uh, as we were experimenting with creating Wikidata items, we focused on the School of Education faculty. Uh, they were sort of like the Goldilocks unit, uh, not too many, not too few, just the right amount to do a little bit of experiment. So if we remove them and sort of look at what we might call the natural results, um, ones without our intervention, natural sciences and applied science, again, predominate. So that's something I want to further investigate. Why is it the case that Wikidata items are more prevalent in natural sciences and engineering and applied science than in other disciplines? I hope to be able to maybe come to some conclusions about that. Also, Wikidata has been uh, touted as a possible identifier hub, a place where all identifiers can be corralled into one place. Um, so my question is, is that really being realized in the case of CU Boulder faculty? Um, I have the data. I haven't compiled it in that way yet, but I want to know that. Um, and finally, there's a much more practical use. Um, I intend to use the spreadsheet I created as a foundation of a Wikidata project that my whole staff can participate in to give them some low barrier hands-on linked data experience. And um, plus, I mean, again, this will, um, I think, bolster the um, CU Boulder's faculty identifier ecosystem, hopefully make them and their scholar scholarly output more discoverable uh, on the web. Uh, as we saw, only 40% of our faculty have a Wikidata item, and not all the Wikidata items that do exist include all the identifiers that I was looking at, or some of them don't even include a, a, an affiliation with CU Boulder in their Wikidata item. So there's a fair bit of work still to be done, and um, I basically have the project ready to launch. Um, we are in a bit of disruption here on my team, and I'm looking for a propitious time to start that, but um, I hope to uh, get it done within this year. And that is all for me. Thank you.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Chris, it looks like there's a quick question in the chat for you. OK. Um, did you check who had been creating items or adding identifiers to them of your faculty? I didn't investigate that fully, but it looks like uh, bots are at work. <laughs> it looks like there it looks like there's a lot of bot activity that's doing this and it also seemed to me that uh, maybe alumni of a lot of this was being done by alumni of certain um, universities uh, so you know their graduate students or whatever you know so it, that that is something that to be looked at I Boy, that's that would be a big undertaking, but I, it seems that that I attribute most of this work to bot work. That makes sense. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, so let's send it now over to Karen Snow from Dominican University, whose project I think will complement this one very nicely. I know. I was just about to say, Willie, took the the words out of my mouth. This is a nice transition um, here. So let me share my screen. All right. Thank you. Um, hopefully, everyone can see that. Okay. Um, so. I, I'm, I'm a little bit different situation because I am a professor in the School of Information Studies, so a library school. Um, and um, I want to talk a little bit about an assignment that I have in, in the metadata class that I teach that involves Wikidata. So, and I will say just from the outset to give credit where credit's due, Elizabeth Roque, who is an adjunct professor for us teaching the metadata class, um, she's the one who officially came up with this assignment, even though we kind of worked together to decide this is what we wanted. But uh, this, this is mainly hers and I, I use her assignment, she uses mine and so on and so forth. But let me explain the assignment first. Um, so first of all, um, we have students create their own Wikidata account and then create an entry for one Dominican University faculty member. Okay, so it's very similar to what Chris is doing. So we, uh, we wanted to, yeah, create, create more um, entries for our faculty members uh, there. So we figured that's a pretty specific uh, type of entry that we wanted them to create. Um, in addition to adding just the basic information about a person, so just talking about a person entry, you know, the language, label, description, and aliases, a student must also add um, instance of human, an employer, Dominican University, as well as eight other statements. So a total of 10 statements with uh, at least five that have references associated with them. And then the students, in addition to that, uh, must write a one paragraph of reflection on the process. So why they chose the person that they did, how they felt about that creation process, any hiccups, um, and how the exercise is different from the other uh, class metadata exercises. So far in the class, we've primarily been working with you know, Dublin Core and XML and, and perhaps, you know, not even mods yet, we're, we're on mods now, but uh, mainly XML based um, standards. So just to kind of see how this differed, this experience differed right, from, from that. Uh, some of the benefits of this assignment I found is that it's a way for students to learn about linked data in a kind of more user-friendly way. I actually used to have an, a linked data assignment. It was just RDF XML. They create XML documents, which is not necessarily a bad thing to know that, but um, it, I liked having kind of that user-friendly interface to learn more about linked data concepts and principles there, so with Wikidata. Um, and also they learn about linked data in a like real world environment as opposed to kind of this, you know, here creates an RDF XML document in Oxygen and not really seeing how it um, interacts with other metadata. I thought that this was a great way to kind of learn about how linked data works generally in the real world. Um, within certain assignment parameters, um, you know, the students, I feel they have a freedom, right? I mean, obviously they have to choose a Dominican faculty member, but otherwise, you know, just kind of using uh, the models that they see in other other entries and so forth um, allowed them to kind of say, okay, well, this, these are the ones that I should probably include, but there's some flexibility there, right? So they kind of had some freedom to do a little bit of what they want, which I love. Students love, <laughs> by the way, they like having uh, that freedom uh, to kind of to do what they want. That helps them learn a lot better. But there were challenges, as you can imagine, uh, to this process, where most of the students were completely new, they novices to linked data and wiki data. Um, so the, not all of them, but there were quite a few that told me that that freedom and the flexibility and openness of Wikidata was a source of anxiety and confusion, right? Especially since we were mainly working with standards with, you know, here's, there's what you need to do, right? These are the rules, these are the instructions. And of course there are instructions and rules um, in Wikidata, but because of the additional flexibility, it just kind of created some anxiety for them. 
And there's also some confusion about the definition, um, scope, use of the property. So just as a few examples, um, there was, you know, remember these are Dominican uh, faculty members, people. And so oftentimes they would include properties for like physician health and occupation. And um, there may be some overlap there, but it just seemed like there was some confusion about when to use those, what values we should use for those, the academic, academic, um, actually academia.edu, sorry, I mistyped that. Academia.edu profile, um, that is actually like a separate site, right? Academia.edu, but they didn't know that. They didn't know that that was actually a separate site. They just assumed that was like the Dominican faculty members page on the Dominican site and they put the URL for that. So there's just some confusion essentially regarding some of the properties. And also a lack of understanding about the need for other Wikidata entries to exist to complete certain statements. So a lot of them were just like, I want to add a, a statement about, you know, this person wrote this work, right? And it seems very simple on the surface, but in actuality, it's a little bit more complicated, right? Because you have to have another entry oftentimes for, for the actual work. And so they, they had all these, these workarounds that were just, they were just not accurate in terms of how they did it, but they tried. I appreciate their effort, but it did um, create a lot of errors uh, what they were trying to do. And for me, um, one worry that I have, you know, I did provide a lot of feedback to the students um, and, and told them, please go back and, you know, correct the mistakes if you have any, please continue to use Wikidata in the future, get to know it. Um, but I don't know if they'll actually do that. <laughs> so, um, so there may be con continued errors in, in there as, as well. But um, so thoughts on the future. And I do, I recognize that there was, I had a, one of my current students in, in this room right now. So maybe she can provide some additional thoughts on this, but um, just very quickly, um, perhaps I can require students to correct the mistakes if there are any like glaring errors, not any kind of differences of opinion, but true glaring errors as part of their grade. I didn't do that this, this time. Um, perhaps a different area of focus. Dominican University where I work is not a huge school. So we're gonna run out of faculty members eventually. So, um, so what, what perhaps is another good area of focus, which pre brought me to another train of thought about perhaps partnering um, with a library or archive that, is, that are doing existing uh, linked data projects like these wonderful people here today um, and having kind of those clear project parameters and have my students help uh, with that. That way they can really see um, more clearly kind of the bigger picture of what they're doing, how their work contributes to that project as opposed to just kind of having this, this, this class project. But I'd be interested in hearing about your uh, other ideas that you may have to make this a, a better learning experience for library school students to learn about linked data and Wikidata. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, that generated a lot of questions. I noticed. <laughs> I and was I just trying wanna, not to look at the chat. I just want to highlight one before we move on, which was, um, uh, were there, was there any discussion about ethics, uh, like things that students shouldn't edit, like gender statements or citizen uh, statements, um, things like that? Yes. Yes, there was. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was more exciting. Do you probably remember that? Because I had Will guest speak in my class. I had Elizabeth guest speak and Will guest speak. And that was definitely a topic of conversation, I think in both of the guest speaking, um, right? We did, I think we discussed that from what I remember. Yeah, is the ethics of that. So absolutely. So it was not just purely creating these entries, you're done, right? There, there was a lot of kind of discussion generated from that as well for the students, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And for everyone else who has questions, we'll, we'll get to them at the end, but I wanna keep going just so everyone has a chance to go. And so now we'll uh, hand it over to uh, Marianne Swaregna um, from Western Michigan University. So take it away. Okay, great. Let me uh, put my screen up. Okay. Um, so I kind of following this sort of education theme we have here, uh, I'd like to talk to you about a Wikidata, Wiki, Wikidata edit-a-thon I did for um, Indiana and Michigan Book Awards. Um, so even though I, I, I'm uh, cataloging a metadata uh, librarian at the at Western Michigan University Libraries, I'm also the chair of a steering committee for um, a group called the Linked Data Users Group um, through Midwest Collaborative for Library Services. 
And oh, how do I advance my slide? There we go. No? There. <laughs> so who we are. So this this group um, is is a group of um, librarians and just interested parties throughout kind of this, the, the Midwest region of um, Indiana and Michigan. And we're connected to the Midwest Collaborative for Library Services, which is a, a nonprofit. It's a member driven organization. Um, and it serves, you know, a, a wide variety of, of types of libraries. And um, on the steering committee, we have, uh, we have library folks from um, large public universities, um, from small um, public libraries, um, a special libraries within public libraries, just a, a really good mixture of people, which all have um, very different needs uh, and interests when it comes to learning about linked data. Uh, and the, our mission is uh, kind of to create awareness, um, discuss amongst ourselves and, and, and kind of in a larger group, um, educate and bring kind of those educational tools um, and events kind of back to our own libraries and the people we work with, and to host the occasional event um, about linked data and how it's being used in libraries. And um, our audience, you know, a lot of time are um, definitely a lot from from public libraries but a lot of people who are very new to linked data and they know of it um, but they you know being especially in public libraries they want to know what is the practical use of it like right now and being in public libraries too a lot of times they, they don't have the um they don't have the funds for professional development they don't have the time for professional development so they need something that is very low barrier um very introductionary and very hands-on um, so we thought as a group that learning about Wikidata uh, would be a great way, you know, to introduce them to kind of the larger concept of, of linked data, um, but also kind of give them that hands on experience um, in the form of a Wikidata edit-a-thon. So we planned an event in April um, and we decided to kind of spread it over about a week. So we had an opening event uh, where we um, had people register um, using Zoom. And we gave, um, I gave an orientation um, to Wikidata um, and kind of a, an orientation to the general concept of an edit-a-thon. Um, and then we discussed our subject, which was um, the book awards um, for the state of Indiana and Michigan, um, kind of the, the region of the area that, that of the people that were gonna um, kind of participate in this. Um, and then we kind of, we did an introduction to kind of the concepts, and then we did some kind of live editing um, and kind of a, kind of a demonstration of how kind of the mechanics of it all works, and and then we took a chunk of time and let them actually edit within Wikidata, um, and asking questions the whole time. So kind of you know that initial hand holding, um, and then at the end of the opening event, we kind of had some some wrap up. People shared their ideas, their their asked questions. Um, you know, and then we kind of talked about the next steps, which was a kind of the rest of the week with independent editing using um, the data sets we had created um, for these book awards and the book of people who received these book awards. And then at the end of it all, we gathered again on Zoom um, and we reviewed the data and dashboard um, about how much they all did. Uh, we kind of celebrated the whole thing. Um, we, we talked about, um, you know, what it felt like to be an editor. And I gave them a brief introduction to querying the data and, and, um, and how to use the, the query service. So a lot of first, first timers, um, kind of like that opening introduction. So for the actual edit-a-thon, um, I highly recommend this resource, which is how to run a Wikidata edit-a-thon. Um, I, as a as a first time uh, edit-a-thon um, person, I <laughs> really use this a lot, and it was a great resource. Um, and these slides are up uh, in Sketch, so take a look at those. Um, 
and then to kind of train Wikidata editors, because I know even with my little opening introduction, um, people need a lot more than that, that brief introduction. So we could point them to all of the training modules that exist online, uh, Wikidata tours, which were um, a big hit. And, um, and I know a lot of people really liked these one pagers, uh, kind of like one pager instructions that they could print out and have sitting in front of them. And then to actually host the event, I created an event page that had our schedule, had um, examples for the data models, had um, links to the um, had links to the Google Sheets um, for the data sets um, where they could, you know, go in and they could add their name to the to the the line of the um, person or the award that they were going to work on, so there wouldn't be any overlap. Um, we used a dashboard, which tracked all of the um, work everybody was doing. Um, and then we had a Slack channel going um, throughout the week that was uh, monitored constantly for questions, um, encouragement, sharing cool examples as we found them. Um, you know, I, I had a book on Michigan mermaids that was that had an illustrator and two authors and how to handle that kind of thing. Um, so everybody could kind of contribute and talk about the process as they were learning. So over our week, we managed to um, create 133 items um, in Wikidata, um, edited a whole bunch more. Um, we added uh, about over 2,000 edits, which was which was pretty exciting, especially for a bunch of you know first timers working on items individually. Um, and then a whole bunch of references, um, which is great. I really stress the importance of, of references. And I think the topic really connected with a lot of the people that were um, participating. Um, they recognize a lot of these books. They recognize a lot of the authors. Um, and they're all getting you know, pretty excited about um, actually getting in there and contributing to the data. And then during the closing event, um, I was able to give a you know a brief overview of the Wikidata query service. Um, there's another one pager I could I could point them to so they could go back and experiment with it. Um, but I think what was most exciting for them is that they could kind of immediately see you know this um, kind of the return on their time investment. Um, so all of the data, there's some of this, some of this data existed before the event, but most of it did not. Um, there was not a lot of representation for this author's award. So this is, um, they completed the spreadsheet of the Indiana Authors Award. And so I was able to kind of show them the different views and they were pretty excited about this uh, timeline view um, to be able to get back all of the information they just put in. So in the end, we ended up to, we ended up creating a bunch of new Wikidata editors and then they were very excited about continuing with the progress um, and keep working on the spreadsheet, which is still open. Um, so at the end of it, uh, we added a, a lot of, you know, regional information to Wikidata and that was uh, pretty, pretty exciting. Well, thanks, Marianne. I'm glad that event went so well. Uh, thanks for sharing all of that with us. Um, and now we'll send it over to Virginia Poundstone from the Megahertz Foundation, who's been patiently waiting, and we'll close out our little uh, overview of Wikidata projects. So take it away, Virginia. Thank you so much, Will, and thank you to all of these presenters. What inspiring projects. I just have to say, um, wow. Uh, so I, I'm so excited for the Q&A after this. So let me go quickly to get to that. So my name is Virginia Poundstone. I am the Director of Product and Content at the MHC Foundation, and I work very closely with Sharon Mazota, who is our metadata consultant, helping us with our project, which I'm going to tell you about. I am presenting on behalf of Sharon in concert with her while she is enjoying her vacation. So I just want to shout out that I am really presenting Sharon's work here um, for everyone today. So um, what is Curationist? So Curationist is a nascent platform for reimagining cultural heritage. We work to reimagine these cultural narratives through curated collections and research-based editorial articles. 
In order to accomplish this, we need to be able to easily find, um, sort, organize, and curate content that we want to write about. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of issues with this in terms of the diasporic nature of all of this open knowledge content that exists in the cultural heritage realm. So we had a few problems to solve. First, we needed to create some curation tools so that it would be easy for our researchers to find the materials. And we realized that it being this diasporic experience for them was frustrating and a waste of their time. So our first thing that we did was to create an aggregated database of as many open access collections as we could. So we currently have 4.4 million work records from nine different open access institutions. They're all museums at this point. And in order to aggregate this data and maintain as much of the data from the source as we could, we had to create custom crosswalks between each institution and our robust schema. As you can imagine, there's a lot of chaos in this metadata and we have a tremendous amount of data cleanup work to do. So we have a lot of work to do, but our goal is really, our guiding light is that we are here to deepen cultural awareness and make content from around the world joyfully accessible and dynamic. We believe very much that cultural heritage is a dynamic piece of material and content for us. It's not um, locked away behind doors and static in terms of the information that we know about it. And we are committed to equity, justice, and expanding open access as much as we possibly can. So everything that we have available is open access on our site, meaning we use Creative Commons licensing. So everything you find has a Creative Commons license associated with it, either Creative Commons public domain mark, Creative Commons uh, uh, zero, or CC by. We are part of this large open knowledge ecosystem. As um, you've seen, all of these projects are, are really trying to figure out how do we connect into the open knowledge ecosystem and we are no different. We like to see ourselves at the center of this massive system that includes the open free knowledge movement um, where Wikipedia and Mozilla and all of the others are leaders as well as the GLAM institutions that are really interested in making their work more available um, digitally the Creative Commons, all the work that they're doing, as well as the open access movement in higher ed and, and um, K through 12. So here we are at the middle, trying to figure it all out, trying to see how we can sort through all of this and curate it so people are able to find what's useful for them. So this means, like I've mentioned, we are inheriting all of the metadata from institutions as is. And I'm highlighting here this um, this tunio from the Art Institute of Chicago that we currently have on our um, proof of concept site that's live currently. This beautiful mention at the bottom of their metadata. I love this so much. It says, object information is a work in progress and may be updated as new research findings emerge. To improve this record, please email us. And I love this statement because it is at the core of what we're trying to address. Every, we all have limits to our knowledge, and the goal of metadata is to expand access to knowledge, and I would also argue that it's to expand the knowledge about the records themselves. And most museums are on board with this, especially the open access um, museums. That's why they've made it really easily available to others. So the problem here is that the workflow to change this work record requires you taking the time to email the collections, the Collections Institute, emailing you back saying yes or no then they going going into their records and changing the records so there isn't a lot of agency for people to submit uh, metadata about works so curationist is hoping that we will be able to be a place where people can come in and add wikipedia style edits to metadata to update records and um, augment records that currently exist we also uh, work closely with local context to figure out how we can get traditional knowledge labels on these works, as well as biocultural heritage labels on works to identify things that exist in collections that have traditional knowledge associated with them. And as an open knowledge ecosystem member, 
we are very vested in, in we are very invested in figuring out how we make this work within the larger Wikidata ecosystem. So the equation we're heading for is source metadata, curation as layered metadata, TK notices, Wikidata QIDs, and everything is golden. It's perfect. That will be the perfect vision for the future. So as you can imagine, again, there's a lot of chaos that happens with this. Um, how do you how do you maintain any sort of standard um, with this project, even internally for our staff archivists that are adding layers? This is where our, our authority control archivist comes in. And so as data is entered into Curationist database, it needs to adhere as much as it can to our content standards, which are linked here on the slides and are public for everyone to see. Our content standards uh, um, use a lot of uh, DEI best practices in terms of archivist work. So there's some great tips in there if people are interested. Part of normalizing this data is maintaining a list of authoritative terms that may be used on the site um, in various places, titles, agents, media, locations, work types, et cetera. And these authoritative terms are linked to Wikidata QIDs so we can begin to build a base of data for our circular digital solution, which I will talk about next. So at the center is Curationist Database, as I mentioned. So we've ingested 4.4 million works um, and we are in the process right now of cleaning up the data that we ingested from those 4.4 million works across nine institutions, across multiple different taxonomies. And the other thing that's simultaneously happening is our digital archivists are adding layers of metadata um, to our database. So in came the data from the sources and in comes data from our um, staff currently and in the future, the public. So we have an API gateway uh, linked to our database so that it can feed our website. Um, and then we also want to be able to give away keys to this API gateway so that this data can feed other sources, hopefully in a circular way that benefits both the source institutions and the open knowledge movement writ large. So how can we easily share with the open knowledge ecosystem? It's still a really big question. We're just at the beginning of this. Crosswalking to Wikidata, once we've got everything cleaned up, is going to be our next big phase. But right now, we are in this uh, reconciliation workflow process for the data that we've already ingested. And I have a couple great resource links here that are step-by-step -step processes on how we're doing this work in case anyone is facing similar issues. The first thing we have to do is prepare our data um, for recon reconciliation and open refine. So that's spread, looking at spreadsheets, cleaning it up manually as much as you can. Um, and then once we've got it ready to go into open refine, reconciling the taxonomy with Wikidata itself. And then we upload those reconciled Wikidata terms to Curationist database. And that includes adding associated Wikidata IDs, URLs, source terms that match the term. Uh, you know, there's all of that gets also fit into our database. And then if there's any terms um, that are new to the curationist taxonomy that we got from Wikidata itself, then we add that to our taxonomy. And if there's any terms that we couldn't reconcile programmatically, then we need to do it manually and think that through, through an intellectual process. Um, and then sometimes there's no Wikidata term for what we need to add. And then it's a series of adding new Wikidata um, terms, Wikidata QID, Wikidata terms uh, that we're adding to Wikidata itself. So that's um, my brief presentation on how this goes. Please contact Sharon. She's a great resource. If you're um, taking on a big data project, she's incredible, highly recommend her. And if you wanna contact the creationist team, um, please do so. We'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Virginia. And thanks to all of the presenters really quickly, Stephanie, Bettina, Kylie, Chris, Karen, uh, and Virginia again. Oh, and Marianne, sorry. Um, thank you so much uh, for presenting. We covered a lot of different kinds of projects in this short hour, faculty projects, reconciliation projects, in-class assignments, identifier work, edit-a-thons, crosswalk projects. 
Uh, so to all of you out there in LD4 land, I hope you feel inspired and know a little bit more about all the different shapes and sizes Wikidata projects can take. Um, I know there are a bunch of questions that popped up in the chat and we have some time left, which is fantastic. So um, Callie and Joe, did we address all of the questions that uh, appeared as the presentations happened? Yeah, I think some uh, were answered in the chat. We did have one actually from Joe that didn't get answered yet, which is back at Chris's presentation of how many faculty members have Wikidata entities, but lack kind of more gatekept identifiers such as LFC and VIAF. I have that data. I thought I'd analyze that data, but in preparing for this talk, I realized I hadn't analyzed that data. It's definitely something I'm interested in, and it goes along with my um, goal to see is Wikidata really being um, used as an identifier hub. So uh, I regret that uh, I, when I have the time, I didn't analyze it, but that's definitely something I want to look at, yes. Are, are there other questions for the presenters? Uh, if there aren't any, I've got I've got a quick one, which is: Did you have to convince anyone to run a Wikidata project, or was there already something happening, or was it easy? Were people excited about Wikidata? At our institution, people seem pretty excited. Like we just had to kind of show them what we were going to do, and they're like, "Yeah, go for it. We'll give you the data because we're not in the museum, and they just were happy to give it over to us." No, I'm in charge of my class. I can do what I want. <laughs> so no, it's a matter of convincing the students, right? That this is something that you get excited about, yeah. The staff I've trained so far have really embraced it and I don't anticipate any problems with uh, the rest of my staff embracing it. I mean, it's really, um, it's really easy to do and aligns so closely with their cataloging work, I think. So yeah, it'll be an easy sell. I, I would say that obviously as a member of the open knowledge system, open knowledge ecosystem, it was kind of a mandate that we do it, but the hesitation was around resourcing. So um, it's a lot of work and how do we get the resources to really do that work well? Um, it continues to be a struggle. Ours was pretty, it, it arose very organically in terms of wanting to look at using something in the Wikidata ecosystem. And then it just kind of gained steam and everyone was very interested in how we could possibly use it. Any other questions from anybody? If not, I also want to commend all the speakers on coming in under time. That was phenomenal. Uh, and way to go in throwing this together so quickly. Um, thanks, everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'll hop in and say we had a, a slight um, live streaming hiccup. So if we, we should have a recording of the whole thing, which will swap out what's there. But if we if we don't have that, I think the first presentation and a half got clipped. So apo apologies for that. Um, but it was incredible to see so many, so many of these projects. Very inspiring. And it's only day two of the conference, so much more good stuff. All right, well then we'll close it out. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you to the presenters. This was outstanding.